On Wednesday, November 10th of 2010, in Apple Valley, Ohio, 32-year-old Tina Herman never showed up for her four o'clock shift at Dairy Queen. Now, this was very unlike Tina because she was a shift leader, and so she was always on time, and even if she weren't to be coming in that day or if she were to just be coming in late, she would always make sure to tell someone beforehand. But on this specific day, she had no call, no show. So her coworkers tried to get in contact with her, but she wasn't answering to any any calls or text messages. Tina's manager, Valerie Haythorne, had a really bad feeling about all of this, and so she went to Tina's house to check up on her. When she went to Tina's house, she saw Tina's truck in the driveway, as well as an unknown car, but all of the lights inside of the house were on. Valerie went up to the door, and she tried knocking, but there was no response, and so she just left a note on the door and left. But even though she left, she still had a really bad feeling about all of this, and so she decided to call the police. Hi. My name is Valerie Haythorn, uh-huh. and I work out at Dairy Queen. I'm the general manager out there. Uh-huh. One of my employees did not show up for work this afternoon at 4 o'clock, okay. you know, which is totally uncharacteristic of her. She's one of my managers. Okay. I drove out by her house and went and knocked on the door and left her note. She's not answering her phone, which is totally uncharacteristic. She's not answering her text. Her truck's oh. there, and her coat is in the house. What's her name? Her name is Tina Herman. You know that she and her boyfriend are splitting up, and he can be a real jerk with her. Okay. Okay, I will uh, have a deputy swing out there and check on it. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank Anytime. you. Anytime. Uh-huh. Bye. 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 And so this officer said that they would do a wellness check on Tina, but these wellness checks were literally a joke because because the first police officer that went, he knocked on the door and when he received no answer, he literally just left. And then the second officer that showed up knocked on the door and when he also didn't get a response, he just left as well. Hello everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth and if you don't know who I am, this is my true crime podcast where once a week I sit down and I talk about all things true crime, ranging from murders, disappearances, cults, even like the biggest drug bust in history, the biggest bank heist in history, all things true crime. So if you're interested in any of that, you can subscribe. And if not, totally chill. And for today's case, we are going to be talking about the case of the Treehouse Murders. Now there is a lot to get through, so we're just going to hop right into it. And so the next day on November 11th, Thursday, Valerie hadn't heard anything from the police as well as not hearing anything from Tina. And so once again, Valerie goes to Tina's house and she knocks on the door, but but still is met with no answer. But this time she notices that in the driveway, the unknown car is still there, but Tina's truck was gone. It was also on this day that Tina's two kids, 13-year-old Sarah Maynard and 10-year-old Cody Maynard never showed up to school that day. The teachers were say that both kids were actually there the day before on Wednesday, but they didn't show up to school on Thursday, nor did they receive a call from anyone. And ironically, across town, there was a man calling into the police reporting his girlfriend, 41-year-old Stephanie Spring, missing. And Stephanie Spring was actually Tina's best friend. Her boyfriend would go on to say that the last time he heard from Stephanie was 12.45 p.m. the previous day, but now she wasn't picking up phone calls or text messages. So once Valerie knocks on the door and she receives no answer, Valerie still does not leave because she gets a really bad feeling about this. So that's when Valerie tries to find an open window of the house, a way to sneak in, and so she walks to the back porch and there's actually an unlocked window. So she goes through the unlocked window, but when she went inside, she was met with a horrific scene. There was blood everywhere around the house. There was blood on the carpets, on the walls. It was splattered on the ceiling. There was even bloody drag marks going from the bedroom to the bathroom. And so without going any further into the home, that's when Valerie immediately called the police. This is Valerie. Hey, Thorn. Uh-huh. I called in last night about Tina Harmon being missing. Uh-huh. I am out at her house now. I just went in her home because I'm so worried about her. There is blood everywhere. Where are you at? I'm sorry. I, I'm I just got back today, so. Okay, okay. Tina Harmon works for me. She did not show up for work yesterday, and we have not been able to locate her or her children for the last it's been 24 hours now. Uh, I just spoke with No, her I'm sorry, ma'am. Okay. I just I'm need sorry. an address. Sorry. I just need an address. 481. Okay, just give us a few minutes and we'll ha- we'll be in run, okay? Okay, that's so Don't go you. back in the house. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying in the driveway. Okay, thank All right, you. No way. All, All right, right, bye. Bye.
Police show up to the home to investigate, and they also take note that Tina and her two kids, Sarah and Cody, as well as Tina's best friend, Stephanie, as well as their family dog, were all missing, but weirdly, the bodies weren't in the house. Although there is so much blood around the house and clearly something happened, they find no sign of any of the bodies. There was blood in every single room of the house, especially on the top steps of the basement and the basement floor. As they were looking through the home, they suspected this to be assault with bodily injury. And so when the police actually start their investigation, it is really tough because around the house, not only do they not find the bodies, they also don't find signs of a break-in or any personal belongings. But they did know that Tina's boyfriend at the time, Gregory Borders, uh, Tina and Gregory had been going through a rough patch recently where they were broken up, but they were still living together and Gregory actually lived at the house with Tina and the two kids but ironically on Wednesday the day where Tina Stephanie and Sarah and Cody were all missing Gregory never came home to Tina's house he actually worked at a Target distribution warehouse and he worked from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. but instead of going home he went to a friend's house all the way out in Urbana which is about an hour hour and a half where Tina lived and Gregory and this friend just hung out they went to dinner and then Gregory ended up spending the night at this friend's house because the two of them had made plans to go golfing early the next morning. And it wasn't until the next day on Thursday, Gregory received a call from Tina's mother at around 12 p.m. of Tina's mom basically just crying to Gregory. She's freaking out because Tina's not responding to her calls or her texts. But surprisingly, Gregory is so cool about it. He's trying to calm her down saying, you know, maybe Tina just took the day off. I'm pretty sure she's okay. But he just assumes that, you know, it wasn't anything major. Maybe she just took the day off and didn't tell anyone. And then after that, he just continued golfing for the rest of the day with his friend. And it wasn't until he got home that night where he came home to all of this crime scene tape and these police officers. And it was then that he realized that maybe something did happen. Gregory was later cleared as a suspect actually because the friend that Gregory was staying with confirmed that the two of them did go to dinner and they were in watching movies all night and then the next morning they really did go golfing and this was also confirmed by security footage of the restaurant and the golf course and so he was exactly where he said he was and he was about an hour and a half away from the crime. So now with Gregory cleared, the police are a little little bit at a standstill because they don't really know where to turn or where to go so they start investigating the house for more clues. As they're investigating the basement they end up finding a Walmart bag and in that Walmart bag was two tarps and a pack of heavy duty trash bags as well as a Walmart receipt and on the receipt it said the exact time and location of where these supplies were bought from and so they go straight to the Walmart they look at the security footage and what they find is a man walking out of Walmart. He looks about 5'7", five, 5'8", five, with brown hair, pretty young, and he was seen walking out of Walmart Thursday morning at 8 a.m., the day after Tina, Cody, Sarah, and Stephanie went missing, and he was walking out of Walmart with two tarps, heavy-duty trash bags, a t-shirt, and a turkey sandwich. And then after that, he was seen walking into his silver Toyota Yaris. And so they took the plates from the Toyota, and they found out that that the owner of this Toyota was 30-year-old Matthew J. Hoffman. Now, Matthew actually had two addresses on his record. His first address was a house that he lived in with his mom, which was 0.4 miles away from Tina's house, but he also had a second address, which was in his name, for a home that was located about 10 miles away from Tina's house. And so they start doing a little bit of digging on Matthew, and they find that Matthew actually has quite a criminal record. And one important thing from his record the day after on Thursday the police were searching for Tina's truck because as I said Tina's truck was there when Valerie went the first time but the second time her truck was gone so they were looking for her truck and they finally found it in the baseball field parking lot of Kenyon College. Ironically that same hour that Tina's truck was found Matthew was pulled over in the same area for like rolling through a stop sign but nothing really happened to Matthew I think like they just didn't 
even give them a ticket. They just let them go afterwards. And so that's already one thing. And then another thing is that the month prior, Matthew's ex-girlfriend had filed a domestic violence report against Matthew for allegedly choking her. And they also find out that Matthew was actually recently fired from his previous job as a tree trimmer because he was, quote, making his supervisor uncomfortable. And so with this domestic violence report, they end up contacting Matthew's girlfriend to try to figure out the whereabouts of Matthew. And so as they're interviewing her, she tells the police that if they want to find Matthew, they're probably going to go to Matthew's house because he used to live with his mom, but he hasn't lived with his mom in months. And so most likely he's at his house. But a little bit of backstory on Matthew J. Hoffman. Matthew was born on November 1st, 1980 in Mount Vernon, Ohio. And not much is really said about his childhood besides that he was an only child and his mom was a stay-at-home mom while his father was a firefighter for 40 years. And it was also said that Matthew, although he was an only child, he really didn't receive much love and attention and actually had a really abusive childhood. His parents split up when he was three and he went to go live full-time with his mother and grew up most of his life without a dad. But since his mom was most of the time out working and trying to provide for the both of them and so Matthew didn't really get to spend much time with her either and so due to this Matthew spent most of his time alone but it's not like Matthew like resented people that had friends or that he needed friends or wanted friends Matthew genuinely really loved being by himself and he preferred to be by himself and he valued his alone time rather than being around other people but after he graduated high school in 2001 he moved to Colorado and this is where Matthew would have his first episode. So there is this wild community of people that I should definitely do a video on because it is insane. So basically, there's this term called frogging with a PH, not an F. And the people who participate in frogging call themselves frogs or froggers. And basically, the concept of what frogging is, is trying to stay inside of a person's home without the person knowing. So sometimes froggers or frogs will create little spaces inside of your house and like there's so many videos online about that of like people catching froggers inside of their house and it's essentially like a fun game for these people and it gives them a little bit of an adrenaline rush when they're not being caught or like kind of the adrenaline of being in someone else's house without them knowing or spying on people without them knowing and the rabbit hole that goes down is insane and it is honestly so terrifying again I should literally do a whole video about it because it is insane but Matthew back in 2001 was a frogger and so he stayed in this couple's condo for months without them knowing until one day he had an episode where when the couple was out for the day he stole all of their credit cards all of their debit cards and then he burnt down the condo and after this he was convicted with arson burglary and motor vehicle theft and after his prison sentence he moved to Ohio with his mother Patricia so now that the police know exactly where Matthew is they send a SWAT team to the house and not only do they SWAT his house before even going into the house they throw a flash grenade inside to kind of blind Matthew wherever he is and they'd be able to detect him a lot easier but that was probably the most extra thing in the world because literally the police go inside and Matthew's just sleeping on the couch like he and so the police are able to arrest him very quickly and take him down to the station but when entering the house Matthew's house was very bizarre to say the least upon walking into Matthew's house all over his living room floor it was basically like one big tarp but on the tarp was leaves leaves from outside like as if he had just raked a bunch of leaves and then put it all over his living room floor and so the police see this and they get a really bad feeling because they're assuming maybe the bodies are hiding underneath these leaves and so they start looking around and they find nothing there's nothing under these leaves and so they're really confused and they go throughout the house and they go to the bathroom and they find that the bathroom walls are all ripped down and replaced with 
bags of leaves. And so the police are really confused and they're thinking that maybe there's something in these bags of leaves, but they start tearing open the bags and there's nothing in them. They also find a locked bedroom, but after breaking in, they found that it was just a weed growing room. And then there was a freezer in there to which they found two dead squirrels inside. And as the police start looking through the kitchen, they see that there's this cabinet that seems to be sort of out of place. And so they move the cabinet over and behind it was the basement door. So they open up the door and they walk downstairs and that is where they find 13 year old Sarah Maynard still alive. She is laying on a bag of leaves and right next to her is a sleeping bag, but her ankles and her wrists were bound together with yellow rope and on her hands she had mittens, but over the mittens was a bunch of duct tape, so her hands were unusable. She was also wearing a diaper made out of a plastic bag. One of the most heartbreaking things about this whole entire case is that when Sarah was being rescued, she didn't even know she was being rescued because she was so traumatized and in so much shock. She wasn't crying. She wasn't freaking out or panicking. The only thing she kept saying was that she was late for school and she kept asking the police where her dog Tanner was. Sarah was later taken to the hospital and was found with an intense form of disassociation. She was acting very numb to everything happening around her and to the whole situation because she was suffering so much shock and trauma. Sarah had explained to the police that on Wednesday when her and her brother Cody had come home from school, they were ambushed by Matthew as soon as they walked in. Matthew lunged at Cody first and so it kind of gave Sarah time to run to her bedroom, but on her way to her bedroom, that's when Matthew grabbed her by her ankles and dragged her. Matthew then dragged her down to the basement where she was left on the basement floor for a little while before he dragged her back up the stairs and laid her on the kitchen floor while he left the house. He then drove Tina's car to a baseball field parking lot where she was put in the trunk and left there covered in blankets for hours. Hours later, he finally came back and then he took Sarah and put her in the trunk of a different car and left Tina's truck at this parking lot. Sarah said that she was then driven to Matthew's house where he bound her ankles and her wrist and also put duct tape and mittens around her hands. She was also gagged and then put into the bathroom closet where she stayed for a couple more hours before Matthew took her out of the closet and put her into the basement. Sarah says that she's not sure what happened to her mom, her brother, or Stephanie, but she's pretty sure that Matthew had killed all of them. Sarah would go on to say that during her four days of captivity, Matthew cut her finger with a knife. He had SA'd her multiple times and Matthew kept on telling her that he was going to release her before Christmas. After Sarah was interviewed, she was then handed over to her biological father, which wasn't Gregory Borders. Sarah and Cody were Tina's kids from a previous relationship, so Sarah went back to her biological dad. Matthew was taken into the station, but he wasn't interviewed immediately because he was actually put into a 24-hour watch after threatening to harm himself multiple times and crying hysterically. And so now we're moving into interrogation number one. And I know what you're thinking, number one, yes, Matthew did not confess to what he did until three interrogations later. These interrogations, I'm just going to tell you right now, are so frustrating to watch. So in the very first interrogation, the interrogation opens up and for the first 10 minutes, Matthew is silent. He does not say a word until he finally reacts to a statement that the detective said. The detective basically just asked Matthew, how do you feel right now? Like what's going through your head? How are you feeling? And Matthew doesn't say a word and all he does is hit his chest twice and then make like an explosion explosion movement with his hands, I guess to symbolize that his heart is broken. But once again, Matthew is still not speaking. And then after this, Matthew closes his eyes and he remains his eyes closed while sitting up for 30 minutes as the detectives are trying to talk to him. And so the detectives get to a point where they're starting to talk as if Matthew isn't there, saying bad things about him and just trying to say things to evoke a reaction from Matthew. Matthew, hoping that Matthew would chime in and try to defend himself or try to clear something 
uh-huh, but Matthew still just sat there with his eyes closed for 30 minutes. 35 minutes after that, Matthew then puts his head on the table and he sits like that for two hours. And so after those two hours, now we are four hours into the interrogation and Matthew has not said a single word. And the only time that he does crack is four hours into the interrogation when he says, quote, I can't tell you anything because I don't know. And then he goes on to speak a little bit more and he says that he doesn't know what he did, but he knows that he did something wrong when he saw a little girl in his basement. And he tries to kind of make himself sound like the hero a little bit because he says that he knows he probably did something wrong when he saw a little girl in his basement. So when he saw that, he tried his best to quote, take care of her. And his version of taking care of her was that he let her watch Iron Man once, he fed her, and he also let her read the book Treasure Island. And even other than those things, he was continuously assaulting, traumatizing her, bounding her at the wrist and the ankle so she wouldn't run away. So after four hours of this interrogation, the detectives notice that they are literally just not going to get anywhere with Matthew. And so the two male detectives leave the room and they bring in a female psychologist and it's only when this female psychologist walks in that Matthew really starts to open up. But ironically, the only time Matthew responds to the psychologist is when he's receiving sympathy from her. And so she says things like, quote, I understand this is hard for you and quote, you didn't mean to hurt anyone. And to this, Matthew responds and he cries to the psychologist, basically saying that he knows what he did is wrong and he knows that he's a monster, but he doesn't want to be a monster. He says that he's read online about antipsychotic medications and he'd be very open to taking those if it meant that he wouldn't hurt anyone else. He then goes on to explain the 2001 condo incident to this female psychologist saying that that was his blackout episode where when he came to, he didn't know what he had done or what was happening, but he had known that he had done something wrong when he came to and realized that all of their debit and credit cards were in his pocket and the condo was on fire. So as you can tell so far that Matthew is very comfortable with playing innocent or playing the victim role and he claims to know nothing about what he did. I mean even about the 2001 arson incident he claims to know that he didn't know what he was doing yet for months and months prior to that he was literally squatting in this like couple's house. He knew what he was doing every single day. He knew to only come out when the couple was gone and he knew what he was doing by stealing all their credit cards and then burning down the place so that there'd be no evidence of him behind. And this could also be a case of Matthew trying to play insanity in hopes of getting sympathy and also dodging hard questions. But although Matthew could just be putting on this act, it is clear that something is wrong with Matthew because as I said, when the police walked in, his entire living room was covered with leaves and throughout all three of these interrogations, Matthew never once mentions the leaves or mentions why he has leaves or why he ripped out his bathroom walls and replaced them with leaves. That's not something that a sane and healthy person does. That's clearly a problem that Matthew is facing. But it was also hypothesized that maybe since his father was a firefighter, maybe the leaves are connected to the abandonment issue he has with his father. Sometimes when people are alone and they have no physical person to turn to, they will turn to inanimate objects for comfort. And that might also explain the 2001 arson incident when his dad is a firefighter and he had set the place on fire. But Matthew did know what he was doing was wrong at the time of the crime. He knew exactly what he was doing because he had purposely covered the basement door with a kitchen cabinet. So if the police came by, they wouldn't be able to see the door and the only person that knew the door was there was Matthew. And also by tying up Sarah, he didn't want Sarah to leave. And that is because he knew what he was doing was wrong at the time of the crime. And at this point in the interview, all there is is the female psychologist. And so at this point, a male detective walks in and immediately when the male detective tries to talk to Matthew, all he does is curl up into himself and he kind of like 
pushes himself away from the detective, kind of like something a child would do, like a I'm not talking to you sort of thing. And then on top of that, when the male detective is trying to talk to Matthew, he literally starts covering his ears so he doesn't have to listen to the detective. And this male detective also calls Matthew out on all of the leaves inside of his living room and his bathroom, but Matthew just remains silent and looks down at the floor. And you will notice throughout these interrogations that the only time Matthew makes a reaction or looks up from the ground is when he's receiving sympathy or being cared for. And so the psychologist and the detective kind of harness this a little bit and they start to kind of play the role of parents to Matthew. And so the female psychologist is more nurturing and mothering while the male detective is kind of speaking to him as a father figure. And this dynamic actually works and Matthew starts talking a little bit more. And so they're thinking, okay, perfect. Because as I said, they don't have the bodies of Tina, Cody, or Stephanie or the dog yet. They don't know where these bodies are. And so they're trying to get Matthew to tell them where they're at. And so while they kind of have Matthew in this vulnerable spot, the male detective tells Matthew, put on your coat. We're going to go back to your house and maybe going back to your house will jog your memory and you'll be able to figure out what happened. But unfortunately, this ride was simply just a joy ride for Matthew because as soon as they showed up to the house, he didn't know anything of what happened. He can't remember anything and he refused to say a word. And so interrogation number two rolls around. And at this point, Matthew has been in prison for four days and Matthew actually requests to meet with the psychologist and the detective from last time. And this time, Matthew still weirdly once again is not talking. I mean, even though he had requested to be there, he was not saying a word. The only time Matthew actually makes eye contact with the detective is when the detective makes a comment to Matthew about how sometimes he will advocate for the criminals that he's working with because he believes that everyone is innocent until proven guilty. And at this point is the only time that Matthew makes eye contact with the detective because once again, he's receiving sympathy. And then randomly in the interview, Matthew points down at the detective's ankle and he asks the detective, what is that? And the detective said, oh, that's my gun because apparently he had like a holster on his ankle where his gun was attached. And then right after the detective said that, Matthew immediately asks if he could go to the bathroom. And so the detective looks at Matthew and says, quote, you're not gonna try to overpower me and take my gun, are you? And Matthew responds by saying, quote, no, I won't, but you could give it to someone if you want. And so the detective actually cuffs Matthew as they walk to the bathroom because he just felt really uncomfortable that Matthew asked to like get up and go to the bathroom after making that comment. And so they get back from the bathroom and the detective is now trying a new approach. And so he tries kind of to self-pity himself and the detective says, quote, I'm sorry, I tried, and quote, I feel like I've failed you. This actually gets a reaction out of Matthew, and Matthew responds with, quote, no, I failed myself. So again, he's taking a situation that is supposed to be about another person and putting it about himself again. And so at this point, the detective and the psychologist are really getting nowhere with Matthew because he's barely speaking. And so they just straight up ask him, why did you request to be interviewed by us today? And so then that's when Matthew says that he had a dream the night before. And in this dream, he was at a food processing plant and he saw, quote, some really disgusting stuff in the garbage can. He explained that at this food processing plant, it was a plant where they chop up food. And when he looked into the garbage bags of this processing plant, he saw chopped up body parts in there. And the detective calls out Matthew and says, Matthew, is this actually a dream or is this real life? Did you actually take the bodies to a food processing plant? But Matthew, Oh my, as Matthew does, he tries to spin it and make it about himself. If Matthew genuinely felt guilty and remorseful about what he did, he would want to help. He would want to bring justice to the people that he had killed. He'd want to bring peace to Sarah and lay these people to rest and give them proper burials. But instead, when the detective asks him, where are the bodies? Matthew responds to this by pointing at the detective's gun on his ankle and saying that the detective should just take his gun and shoot him in the head right now so that this could all be over with. Once again, Matthew is not taking 
any accountability for what he did. And even if he didn't remember anything, if he genuinely didn't remember anything, he wouldn't dodge the question like that. He would simply just be like, I'm sorry, I don't remember, I don't know, I want to help, but I can't help. But instead, he, again, just makes it about himself. He just wants sympathy so bad, which makes no sense because he's truly just making this whole situation about himself. Sarah doesn't have a family anymore by the hands of Matthew. Matthew had killed everyone she loves, yet he wants sympathy. Like, that is insane to me. And so the detective straight up tells Matthew, you're already in jail. Like, you have your trial coming up. You're about to face time in prison. If you tell us where the bodies are at, it would not, you know, harm you at all. If anything, it would help your case. But Matthew, once again, refuses to tell them. He says that he doesn't know what happened. He doesn't know where the bodies are at. And so Matthew just further continues to play victim and essentially just trying to buy as much time as he can. And at this point, the female psychologist is fed up because this is their second four-hour interrogation and they have gone absolutely nowhere. So the female psychologist tells Matthew, think about your future. If you don't confess to what happened, everyone is going to see you as a monster. It's a lot better if you tell us where the bodies are because by you giving justice to this family, it makes you look like a better and stronger person. But Matthew, responds to this comment weirdly gets defensive and he tells a psychologist and the detective that the only reason he requested to meet with them today is because prison life is lonely and the people behind bars are really mean to him and he just needed a little break from all of that. And another thing I forgot to mention real quick, he told the psychologist and the detective that another main reason why he was there was so that he didn't have to take his anti psychotic medication which was a shot of Thorazine so he used this as like sort of a little break from everything oh my he literally told them that he wants to meet with the detective and the psychologist because he's gonna confess he's gonna finally bring justice to the family he's gonna bring closure to Sarah he's done he's gonna lay it out on the table and then he goes and does none of it because in the back of his mind he knew he wasn't going to confess he just wanted to not take his medication and get a little time away from his prison cellmates and if you remember once upon a time he was so down with taking antipsychotic medication furthermore he's even done his own personal research and educated himself on it it's kind of like in the moment he was <gasps> lying for <gasps> sympathy. It's kind of like he wanted someone to look at him and be, aw, he doesn't know any better. It's all in his head. He can't help that he has all these mental issues. I mean, he wants to be a good person. He wants to take medication and get better. Maybe he is a good person deep down. But is that the same man that's sitting in this interrogation room wasting four hours of a detective and psychologist's time, time that they could be spending with other people, but instead Matthew is just going in there with his own selfish reasons in that he doesn't want to take his meds and he doesn't want to hang out with rude people. That is evil. That is so evil. And I doubt that he's the only person in that prison taking Thorazine. There's probably so many other people also having to take shots of Thorazine every day. What makes him so different from those people? Why do those people have to take it and then he just gets a free pass? It's again, so narcissistic. It's so selfish. This man is gonna put me into cardiac arrest. I can't. And so when this happens, clearly the detective and the psychologist feel like they just wasted all of their time talking to Matthew for four hours, time that they could have spent assisting actual cases where people were actually going to confess and helping other people, but instead Matthew just wants to sit around and waste their time. At this point, the detective stresses to Matthew that this is the last time you're ever going to talk to 
us. And if you want to confess, it's not going to be to us. And we're pretty nice to you right now. Because as I said, they kind of had this like parental dynamic going on. So there would even be times where the detective would like put uh, his hand on Matthew's shoulder, kind of like a father figure. Or sometimes the female psychologist would put like her hand on his knee if he was crying. Again, sort of as like a mother nurturing thing. And so they stress to Matthew that the next people he gets probably won't be as nice as them. And so if he wants to say anything, he has to do it now. But once again, Matthew remains silent. And so that leads us to the third and final interrogation. So they realized that Matthew was not going to admit verbally to what he did. And so that's when they decide to give Matthew the opportunity for a written confession instead. And it was in this written confession where Matthew would finally reveal the real details of what happened on Wednesday, November 10th. He writes in his confession that the day before the attack Tuesday, November 9th, he was staking out in front of Tina's home all night long and he even slept in the wooded area in front of their house overnight in a sleeping bag. Until the next day on Wednesday morning, November 10th, he saw the two kids go off to school and Tina and her best friend Stephanie go out for the day. Once he realized that everyone was gone, he snuck into the house through the garage. His original plan was to just go in and rob Tina's house and the reason why he had picked Tina's house specifically was because Tina had no no neighbors. She was literally just surrounded by wooded area. That means there was no neighbors and no witnesses. It wasn't until while he was robbing the home, Stephanie and Tina came back home and caught him in the act. In a panic, he ambushed the both of them and that is when he said that he had a blackout episode. Matthew was armed with a jungle primitive SOG knife and had stabbed Tina and Stephanie to death. Once he came to and realized what he had done, he was trying to figure out his thoughts and ended up killing the family dog Tanner because he wouldn't stop barking. And during this time of him trying to process what was going on, he actually attempted at dragging Tina and Stephanie to the bathroom, trying to clean them up. Because in his mind, he thought that if he cleaned up the blood off of them, then the crime scene wouldn't look as bad as it was. But whilst he was doing this, this is actually when Sarah and Cody had come home from school. And when Sarah and Cody walked in, Matthew immediately lunged at the both of them and began stabbing Cody to death. And after this, he had noticed Sarah was running off to her bedroom and that's when he grabbed Sarah's ankles and dragged her down to the basement where he tied her up and left her there. He says in the note that he's not sure why he let Sarah live, but for some reason he just didn't want to kill her. It was at this time where he took Sarah from the basement and laid her on the kitchen floor while he drove out to Gambier to get gas cans from a local gas station with the intention of burning down the house. But on his ride back from the gas station, he actually got pulled over by a police officer. And this interaction with the police freaked him out a lot to which he didn't go back to Tina's house. He actually went back to his own house where he started up a campfire. Where he burnt his clothes, his shoes, and drank a bottle of wine. After this, he had went back to the household and that's when he grabbed Sarah and put her in the trunk of Tina's car and dropped off her car at a baseball field parking lot while he drove his own car back to Tina's house, put Tina, Cody, and Stephanie's bodies into his trunk and drove off to a wooded area to hide the bodies. After the bodies were hid, he came back to the baseball field, took Sarah out of Tina's truck, and then put her in his car and drove off and left Tina's truck there. And it wasn't until November 18th, 2010, a little over one week after the murders, that is when Matthew finally revealed where the bodies were hidden. He said that he had hid the bodies in the coaxing wildlife area and the bodies were actually hidden inside of a tree. And so police went to the wooded area, blocked it off until they later found a tree with a big square cut 
out of it about six feet above the ground and a second larger hole near the branches. And so when they took out this big chunk of wood, inside was black trash bags. And inside these trash bags would be confirmed to be the remains of 32-year-old Tina, 10-year-old Cody, 41-year-old Stephanie, and their family dog, Tanner. And grossly, in his confession, Matthew kind of bragged a little bit and even further explained how he put the bodies in there. He said that he had put the bodies in there by using a rig and pulley system as well as using the top hole as a way to lower the trash bags in there. And he had made this hole and hollowed out the tree, quote, all by myself. Again, just sort of bragging, which is disgusting. And he had said that he had learned how to do this from his experience as a tree trimmer. And then on January 6, 2011, the following year, that is when Matthew had avoided the death penalty by pleading guilty to 10 felonies. He was sentenced to life without possibility of parole. And shortly after his house was put into foreclosure and the tree that all the bodies were found in was cut down. And yeah, that is the end of today's video. If you guys enjoyed, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Today's case was very interesting, but also very frustrating. And I would love to hear your guys' thoughts and opinions in the comments below. Do you think Matthew was being truthful and that he didn't know? Or do you think that he was just wanting some sympathy and refused to admit to what he had done? But yeah, that is all for me. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day today. Make sure to go outside today, get some fresh air stay hydrated today please drink some water a lot of people are getting sick right now so if you are sick right now please make sure to stay hydrated take care of yourself and yeah that is all from me and as always i love you i love you i love you and i will see you guys next week bye